So I just had a conversation with Michael Gardner, a kind of well-known guy within the uh, the small community of cold emailing, and this conversation was very interesting, both for you as a beginner, both for you as a more advanced emailer. We talk about the future of email, how to use AI uh, within email, how to optimize your emails for deliverability, how to use the right platforms to host your emails on, all the ticket tech techniques that you actually need to, uh, to to know before you can start succeeding with cold email. So you as a beginner, you as a more advanced guy uh, with the cold email, you will enjoy this conversation very, very much. This is juicy, juicy stuff. So yeah, enjoy this so much with a cup of coffee, with a cup of tea, a glass of wine if you're into that. And just sit down for the, uh, for the next 54 minutes and just enjoy this conversation very much because it will provide a lot of gold uh, to the future, your future success with cold emails. Yeah, right. so who are you, man? Yeah, my name is Michael. I have been building agencies since 2015, and currently I have both a training program and an agency where I help business owners, B2B business owners, with cold email. Awesome, man. And how big is your company right now? How many employees do you have? Yeah, so we have about 16 team members. Crazy. Nice. And you look at it out of Thailand. But I also saw, the reason that I know you is because my friend is a part of uh, Apex, I believe, where you also coached inside. So you knew Imagetsu also, right? Yeah, I've I've known Iman for maybe maybe four or so years. That was on one of the first paid programs I joined. And then I attended one of his masterminds where I um, met him and some of his team. And I've um, been collaborating with them in different ways in terms of training programs or live coaching or campaigns um, since then. Awesome, man. Awesome. So what is uh, the achievements in, uh, you know, what are you doing in, in cold email? What are you, do we have some specific examples of what you succeed uh, with, with your clients? Yeah. So kind of give an overview of what I do. I do two things. So for larger companies, I entirely manage their campaigns. When I say larger companies, our average client managed campaigns for is doing somewhere in the realm of five to $15 million a year. So we're normally a pretty established company with multiple SDRs, a sales team, and they come to us to entirely manage their campaigns. For them, the goals are a little bit different because normally it's based on providing leads to SDRs for long-term nurturing of higher ticket products. And then on the other hand, I wanted to provide something to the more entry-level marketing. So let's say people that are maybe at 100K or a few hundred K a year, where it doesn't make sense to hire us to manage your campaigns. And that's where I created a training program called Grow B2B, where I show them the same ways I manage campaigns for larger companies, but they can go and implement on their own because it's much more cost-effective. Awesome, man. So you work primarily with the bigger companies? Yeah, in terms of the agency, primarily with large companies. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. And how do you get clients? Do you use cold email to get your clients? Uh... Yeah, so in terms of how I get my clients, if I had to break it down into... Um, three core areas. We actually, we do, we do a lot of client acquisition, but if I had to break it down to like the three core areas, cold email is going to be tied at the top of personal brand. Now between personal brand, there's a lot of ways to get clients. I get clients from interviews like this podcasts from YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. Like I pretty much do a little bit of every social media platform. So cold email and personal brand are kind of tied for where I get the most of my clients. Um, I would say that cold email gets me to bigger companies because normally you don't have like a sales manager of a company, a massive company watching my YouTube. That's just not the case. That's normally going to be smaller uh, agency. So uh, for the agency I have, normally it's cold email. Uh, for the training program, normally it's social media. And second to that, um, this is kind of an underrated one, but we do get a lot of calls from SEO and that's very mixed. We have massive companies coming through and we have smaller companies and medium-sized companies. So yeah, a lot of people think of like client acquisition is just like, a few things, but, um, you know, there's a lot of things that work and like SEO is something you don't really hear talk about much, but we get consistent calls from SEO. Yeah. I'm hearing also like SEO is the biggest, best investment that you can do as a company, uh, in order to get more sales just because of the organic reach that you're getting, uh, out of it, it's like hands down better than paid advertising, almost YouTube, uh, any other platform out there. So yeah, SEO, you're getting a lot of uh, people from that as well. Yeah. So SEO is something where funny enough, we never were intentional about it. Um, we just started posting, like we mainly started building out our website for like social proof because yeah. um, from running campaigns, I found that most people have like the one page click funnels agency um, type website. And those guys never get results because no one trusts them, <laughs> especially if we're working at big companies. So we just slowly started building out our site to look more like a legitimate agency and less like, I like to call them landing page agencies. Yeah. Um, and uh, naturally, we just started getting some traction. And uh, yeah, we just get some really good calls from um, from SEO. You know, the other day we had someone who's doing around 30 million a year for their business book a call from SEO. 
is just you know, normally the way SEO works is um you know a, a, let's save it a um, I don't know let's save it a CRO or a CMO tells the head of sales hey go find someone for cold email they search cold email agency and they normally book a call with everybody on page one sometimes page hmm. two and we often fall into that category. Wow, amazing. I've not thought about that when it comes to client acquisition for B2B before. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's something that we've never been intentional about, but we've, we've just done like a random acts of improving the website. And whenever we do, we get more calls. So it's probably something I should systematize a bit more. It's definitely yeah. not my expertise. Like I can't tell you anything about SEO. I have no idea how it works. I no. just know that I'm, I'm an outbound guy. It just happens to be something that's worked for us. Yeah. You seem also like you are delegating a lot of the tasks so you can focus on your core areas of genius, if you can say that, right? Yeah, I, I definitely have a team helping me with a lot of things. I um, In terms of like where I put my time, I put my time into mainly mainly content and marketing and sales, content marketing and sales. So, you know, I, I do my own posts on social media. I build out our own outbound campaigns as a company, and I do still do all of the sales. Uh, but in terms of like service delivery or any other of the more nitty gritty things, I'm I'm not too involved unless it's in a creative angle or a strategy or planning angle. All right, makes sense. That's also what we're trying to do uh, with my uh, my agency. We're really much focusing on our core areas. Uh, so I'm also focusing on what I feel like I'm best to, which is marketing and sales. And also we are moving over in content as well. Um, so really, it's 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 very important. I feel like it's it's just core focusing on the things that you feel like you're good at, and then outsource everything else so you can become a master at it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, uh, it's been slowly doing that over time. And I also try to like, one thing I found too, is, um, filling in those gaps with full-time people has been what's been most successful for me. Cause initially yeah. I started with like, like fractional freelancers or, um, you know, agencies, but over time I've just kind of filled those blanks with full-time people. And it's, um, that's been the most sustainable for me not having to hop back into those areas of business. Yeah. You just feel like you may lose your focus completely and it's so hard to balance out like 50, 50% focus in like multiple different areas of the business. Yeah, I, I agree. Especially for people who are doing agency and something else. I mean, when I started, like I had no social life. I didn't work out. I didn't, I wasn't like, didn't do school, didn't do anything. Right. So like you can, you can give 90 hours, a hundred hours a week to your agency like that. For most people, that's not practical. So um, I think especially considering that most people have commitments such as, relationships or even kids or jobs or you know you really have to kind of figure out what are you going to be putting your time into sure for sure man well let's uh, go over into the nitty-gritty of cold emailing because that's probably why people are watching also because they want to learn who you are as a person probably because you're an interesting person i've heard about you a couple of times before and uh yeah i was so lucky that least you uh, knew you a little bit so uh, we could jump on a call but why is cold emailing the best tool to acquire b2b clients yeah, so cold email is a really low barrier of entry way to reach people, and it also doesn't change too much. Um, so one thing that I I found interesting is I like to talk to like a lot of people that I like to learn from or talk to in digital marketing are guys that have been doing it a long time, and um, it's kind of funny because I'm guessing most of your audience is younger, and you and me are both younger proportionally to like the whole world of business. And you talk to somebody who's been doing things for five or six years, and it seems like a lot of time, but I like to talk to people that have been doing digital marketing since like the nineties, early two thousands. And it's, um, it's funny because they're talking about how, like, uh, one of the, one of the things that's talking to me is like, yeah, we don't really worry about the advertising platforms. We just focus on advertising adaptive platforms as they change. Cause it's just things change. And if you look at like what hasn't changed, cold email has been pretty boring and stayed again, there's always going to be some changes, but it's just, just kind of worked. Um, I don't really see a world where people don't use email. Um, you know, I can't, I don't know if people will still be using, probably going to be using Facebook or something else, but it's just very consistent. Um, yeah. it, it's not, it's not very exciting. And there's very few types of advertising where you can get as specific with who you're targeting as, um, as cold email. You know, if we're running ads, for example, we can get specific, but we can't say, only companies in this headcount with these titles and these locations. So I love how specific it can be. It's also very inexpensive. Um, you know, I've done ads and a lot of other advertising and things, and normally you need a few thousand dollars to play with to test and figure out things are going to work. Cold email is something where, I mean, technically you can do it with no money, but more realistically, a few hundred dollars a month, which is nothing in the realm of B2B. Agreed. Totally agree. And that's also what we've seen. Like we've tried to, to put it up in a table when it comes to the most scalable and easiest entry level platforms to uh, to acquire b2b clients 
and like ads and uh, and cold emails like the only two long term channels that I can see uh, when it comes to building a, a channel that consistently brings income uh, consistent clients like ads it's just way more expensive I've also tried to spend a, a few thousand bucks on failing a lot went back to cold email again and yeah it's it's just so inexpensive man it's so cheap uh, to do it and the beautiful thing is that you can just scrape anyone's email and just send an email to them. If you have something that they are interested in, they will get back to you. Yeah, I, I also think that people sometimes think of cold email as only sales email because cold email is just a way to reach somebody that you haven't had prior contact with. So the people that I see that do really well with cold email look at it not just one dimensionally. It's like cold email can get you featured on blogs or get you interviews or on podcasts or it can get you affiliates or it can yeah. get you to be affiliate partners for people or it can get you a business partner or it can help you meet someone you look up to. So um, I think I like to always change people's perception on cold email is only a sales tool. It's a tool for a lot of things. I've seen people with their only cold email strategy has been getting affiliates. Yeah. I've seen people with their only cold email strategy has been getting press and PR. So it's simply a way to contact people um, and what you do with it beyond that, that is up to you. But it's probably the most effective way to talk to a stranger. Yeah, totally agree, man. And also you you probably know Alex Berman as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he said something in his book as well that when he started to grow his brand, he started doing like just cold emailing podcasts and tried to go down podcasts and on bigger shows. Um, and even though he wasn't a big following, well, if he had something that they hadn't seen before or something that could provide value to their audience, they would say yes and then get him on a, a podcast. So another thing is you want proof, if you want trust, well, send a cold email to someone that you look up to and get their audience uh, to know who you are as a person. That could, uh, that's probably also something that we would uh, explore more. Have you done that? Have you reached out to podcasts, et cetera? A lot. So one of the things where I, I think that a lot of people start, you maybe you start as like a freelancer when you get into an agency and you're doing direct outbound and people forget that you need to do marketing because like cold email is, is, is marketing, it is outreach, but you need to build a brand at some point. Um, yeah. so that is a great way to do so. Um, you know, you know, if people look up done for you meetings, or whenever my companies, you'll find interviews and blogs and features and reviews. Um, I don't rank for my personal name because there's a professional football player who has my name. Yeah. Um, however, if you look at like Michael Gardner, cold email or uh, Michael Gardner entrepreneur, you'll find, you know, dozens of resources, which only that's only going to strengthen what you're doing. Cause if you're running ads, if you're doing cold emails and people can look you up and you look legitimate, that is yeah. going to strengthen the chance you're getting clients. Now, especially if you're targeting bigger companies, if you're targeting smaller companies, sometimes it's okay that you don't have a presence, but if you're trying to sell to large corporations like I do, they're not going to be comfortable risking their job to hire a stranger, but they can't back with social proof when they're showing their boss and trying to get payment approval. So yeah. it helps in a lot of ways. Totally agree. And it's the same thing that we've seen so much after we started on doing YouTube. Uh, just Instagram and focusing so much on building this kind of proof that we actually know what we're talking about. And we're getting so much, so many more inbound leads, so many more people trust us whenever we jump on the call. Like everything is just getting better when you have this kind of social proof. And the the thing that I'll, I'll always mention to to the members inside of Client Culture, which is a program, is that people are go, never going to respond back to a complete stranger. In most cases, if they are a normal person, because you obviously they are, they need to trust you before. So they're checking out your website. They can even check out your socials. But the beautiful thing about cold email is that they will probably just check your website and see, hmm, uh, do they know what they're talking about? And then they'll get back to you if you do. Yeah, I, I do. I do certainly agree with you there. Because um, with, with cold email, if you, you know, unless you have the best offer in the world, a lot of social, like, best offer in the world, you're going to need a lot of social proof, no matter what you're doing. Um, yep. And that kind of brings up the question, well, what if I don't have social proof? I don't have a great offer. Well, a great thing of cold emails, you can also sell emotion. You can yep. target people from the same city that you're based in, have that type of connection. You can target people around a product you're passionate about and use that connection. So there's a lot of unique ways to use it. So I think starting out, I normally recommend people sell more on a, um, a emotional level, which if you want, we could break that down. And then as they get larger and larger, they sell more of logic, which is offer and social proof. I would love to like hear more about that now, if if possible. Yeah. So when somebody first starts in cold email, um, one thing I often hear is, well, I did it and it didn't work. And then you look at them objectively and it's like, why would anybody work with you? And that sounds harsh, but it's true. Like I, um, I, I like to give an example. I'm talking to pure beginners. If you go on Amazon and let's say that you're looking to buy 
say you're looking to buy a pen and you go on Amazon, are you going to buy the one with no reviews or are you going to buy the one with a lot of reviews? You're going to buy the one with a lot of reviews. Now, let's say that you're walking a, a, a shopping area and a really nice salesperson comes up to you and turns out you went to the same high school and you went to the same coffee shops and had the same group of friends and they're selling pens. This person may not have any reviews, but if you bought a pen from him, you bought it because you bought the emotional connection. Where with cold email, how can we do that? Because a lot of times people will start doing cold email and they just immediately think that I can do the same thing as the Amazon seller of 100,000 100, reviews. You can't. So when you're first starting out, I look at what are the emotional connections you can make over email. So there's a million ones you can make, but let me give three examples. Let's say that you went to university. You could reach out to people who went to the same university as you and have your intro line be something relevant to the university. Now, when I talk about emotional-based personalization on a campaign, a lot of people do this in a corporate way. Something like, hey, August, I saw you went to XY University. Me too. That's not going to work. But if you make a joke about the university or something that's like witty, like yeah. um, I did a campaign to a university I went to where I like, um, I, I said something along as like, hey, first name, hope you didn't say in Rinker, it sucked. That was the name of a dorm, but everybody knew it like flooded. Hmm. So like it, it made sense, right? Um, yeah. Another example is like personal interest. Let's say that you're targeting e-commerce brands and you have no social proof or case studies. What can you connect with to another brand that other people can't? Like I'll give myself an example. I grew up skateboarding. If I reached out to skateboarding brands and I talked about how I've been skateboarding since I was four years old and I mentioned a bunch of things that only skaters would know, that connection is an emotional connection, which is likely enough for them to respond, not because I'm so great at what I do and have case studies, but because how many skateboarders reach out to do some e-commerce service. So yeah. those are a couple examples. You can also do a location, like, you know, maybe your hometown, you know, if you're living in your hometown, how many people like, uh, this is a great one. Let's say you're targeting e-commerce. Hardly anybody segments e-commerce by location because people think of e-commerce as just online, but these places have offices, they have stores. So a lot of times their clients, if they're smaller, I'll have them run a campaign to their hometown and maybe only be a hundred hmm. e-commerce stores based out of there. But how rarely does an e-commerce founder have a call to action where it's, can I take you to dinner at this one on restaurant? So I'm always yeah. looking at these ways to sell the motion rather than logic when you don't have the logical reason for someone to buy from you yet. Yeah, makes sense a lot. And whenever you get up to the to actually having a brand, what then you want to focus then more on the transformation, right? Social proof. Yeah. yeah. Then you then you can kind of cut those things out because not cut them out, but those don't last forever and they're not infinitely scalable. Which one thing I like to say is I, I don't think that you should worry about the term scale until you have a bigger company. Cause I see people worrying about that when they have four clients. It's like your time's yeah. not worth anything. It's fine for you not to do something that's scalable. Um, yeah. But at some point you start to lead more of your offer and more social proof. And then you can kind of cut off those things. And the interest in working with you is to learn more about your case studies or to learn more about how you did these big numbers or big things. But that takes a while to get to. Makes sense. And what about, what about a reply rate? What do, what do you typically get? Are you over 5%, 10% even? Or where are you typically at in e for example? Yeah, so e is a weird market because it got ruined by children who went through courses. Yeah. Um, so um, e-commerce is maybe a, a bad example. I'll just give a broad example across all industries. So generally speaking, for reply rate, if you're getting under 1%, that means you're going to spam. You should have at least 1% of people telling you to stop emailing them. So yeah. under 1% on reply rate, you're just, you're just going to spam. Like you should have at least 1% of negative replies. Um, generally speaking, most of my campaigns see around four to 6% reply rate. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I would also say if that, it depends on who you're targeting. Cause, um, metrics are so based on industries. So let's say that you sell a enterprise, um, enterprise software and your customers are fortune 5,000 companies, you know, one deal is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're going after the most, the people who are competed towards the most. If you get a, if you get like one lead out of a thousand prospects, but you're selling something that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, that just might be how competitive it is. Yeah. So sometimes I see people get so caught up in like a blog post or a YouTube channel that gives like a broad range on stats, but they don't look at profitability. So I do use reply rates and open rates and things as like a guiding metric. But at the end of the day, I look at how competitive is your audience? Because reply rate to mom and pop businesses versus CTOs at Fortune 5000, it's going to be night and day different. And it doesn't mean one is good or one is bad. It's just pure competition. Agreed. Totally agree. And it's the same thing with us. We are in Ecom, actually. And uh, and we're doing cold email, or actually email marketing for Ecom brands. And we are sending out a significant amount of, uh, like, way higher volume than you, you, you for example, should in local B2B 
uh, where there's not that much competition and you can kind of target them out and you should get like at least a 5% reply rate at like very, very easily. Whereas in e-commerce, it's it's different. It's very, very different. It doesn't mean that you can succeed with it. It just means that you maybe you have to send out more volume because it's more competitive or maybe you have to personalize more. Maybe you have just to do better than everyone else, right? Ecom is a tricky one because um, what's happened in ecom, and I've, I've been doing cold email for seven years. I've kind of seen this change. Ecom became popular due to courses, which sent an influx of beginners to ecom, which created resentment against ecom agencies because you had a lot of idiots or newbies, whatever you want to call them, who didn't know what they were doing, burn e-commerce businesses. So there's yeah. tons of resentment in that industry. And your competitors aren't necessarily good for just beginners at a super high volume, but churn and burn. So yeah. with e-commerce in particular, social proof is the most important thing. Like, because it's just, I'm sure you see this. There's so many people entering the e-commerce, Facebook ads and Google ads and email marketing and TikTok ads and UGC market that it's very difficult to stand out just based on offer because a lot yeah. of these guys yeah. read Hermosi's book and they make up some crazy <laughs> offer that they can't deliver on and then they fail and quit. So you really yeah. have to lead with social proof in e-com. It's a very interesting market compared to others. Yeah, totally agree. And also, I thought saw that you're part of Scaling with Systems. You were a part of it. Uh, I was also a, a part of Scaling with Systems. So Ravio Bavale, uh, a very, very good gentleman, knows what he is talking about, especially when it comes to um, to uh, to succeeding with marketing uh, in B2B. And he also said that um, that uh, case studies, if you're in a saturated niche, is just about making it your full-time job to get case studies to your business and get social proof, because that's what makes you stand out. Yeah, a, a great example of this is um, if you, one thing I think of taking a step further, and this does help from campaigns I've run, if people can Google your company and case studies come up that are third party, that helps so much because case studies on a website, people don't trust as much. If people can Google your company and if you're a software company, maybe that's Captera or G2 or software advice. If you're an yeah. agency, maybe it's Clutch and Trustpilot um, or Google even. So we also taking those case studies and reviews and not only hosting them on your website, but hosting them on third-party platforms, or when someone looks you up, these third-party platforms add extra social proof, and it validates that person's choice to then talk to you more. Yeah, most definitely. So use Trustpilot as a, as a, as a place where you get all the reviews, for example. Yeah, Trustpilot, Clutch, Upwork, and also on my website, I do collect them as well. Yeah, also just like I'm seeing if if possible, like I'm seeing, for example, you made an interview about, hey, how was it? to to be at scaling with systems if you could get someone else to use their brain and post something on that their personal platform about how it was going together with them that's huge you got like eight or nine thousand views on a video like that right it, so one of the things crazy. i do on my youtube is i um i make content about people who have brands and then i rank for their keywords um it's so crazy, it's good man. for both because ravi gets social proof and yeah. i get traffic I've done the same thing using Iman Godzi's name. I've done the same thing using a bunch of other names. It's a very easy win-win. Like, because when people search Ravi's name, which they do search it because Ravi has a large brand, you know, YouTube likes to show some results that aren't just the exact person. And that's normally going to be interviews or reviews or things of that nature. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, how don't I go into spam? If I'm getting under 1%, what should I do? How do I in, like um, set up the fundamentals so I don't go into spam? What is the best practices? So if you're an absolute beginner, the best way to not go to spam is just to do personalized emails manually. If you have no clients, like that's maybe not exciting or not cool, but like for the absolute beginner, just do manual emails and do personalization. Because at that point, you're not doing anything wrong or gray. You're just sending emails. Now, assuming that you have clients and you you have a bit of resources, um, we can't get super technical in all the settings because it's a it's it's a lot. But broadly speaking, um, we want to start by having the basics covered. This and be buying multiple domains and buying multiple emails. We want to spread out our risk. Whenever we're sending emails, the thought process is how can I spread out risk and how can I appear human? Humans don't have one email address they send a thousand emails a day on. They don't. So the first thing we're gonna do is buy multiple domains, and then we buy multiple emails. We buy two emails per domain. Now, if you're a really large company, let's say that you have dozens of SDRs, we even want to diversify where we're getting domains and emails. We don't want to have all of our domains on GoDaddy. We want to have domains on Google and GoDaddy and Square and Porkbun. We don't want to have all of our emails on Outlook. We want to have Rackspace and Outlook and Google and Zoho. So you want to continue to do more and more diversification the larger you become. Now, for that final part where I said like diversifying all these platforms, 
completely ignore that advice if you're not going to be fueling a full sales team because some yeah. people hear that and then they get obsessed on that and then they don't get anything accomplished and it's just them but for yeah. most people multiple domains multiple emails go through email warm-up um, if you don't know how to do email warm-up look at any of the free resources but instantly dot ai or smart lead makes these are the two best sending platforms in my opinion and rather than yeah. like try to regurgitate the stats just copy theirs they want you to yeah. succeed in their platform they update their stats regularly it's good so domains emails warm up follow their recommended settings um yeah. my settings are a bit different than recommended because i'm doing very high volume i've been doing for a long time but assuming that you're going to have five ten emails the recommended settings are great um and one other consideration of going to spam is google wants people to spend time on email that is their goal they want you to spend time on their platform same thing if like any social media platform their goal is time on platform and one of the main things we're considering is do people actually engage with your emails so funny enough if you have an offer or an email people actually like and they reply to it that alone can be enough to just not go to spam now normally you won't actually have that it's very hard to do that well and most people won't do that well which is normal and that's where we're adjusting with lower sending volumes and more domains and emails um but yeah, that, that's kind of a, the basis. And one other thing I'll add to that is clean data. A lot of people go on Fiverr or Upwork and they find the cheapest person to build a lead list, the person who can do yeah. it for five cents or three cents a contact, and then they get a 12% bounce rate or they're reaching out to leads that aren't actually in their ICP and they don't want their offer and market as spam. And yeah. them being cheap just killed them their campaign. So don't be, don't be a cheap ass on leads, get good leads. Uh, you don't need to spend more than like, 10 to 20 cents generally, um, but leads do definitely matter. Yeah, totally agree, man. And also, yeah, setting up the basics, setting up the basics is so important. Also, why I think most people don't succeed with cold emails just simply because they're ending up in Spain before they start in getting any momentum whatsoever on the cold email side. Yeah. I also yeah. think it's a good thing though, because cold email is like, it has a very low barrier to entry overall. And if yeah. it was a little bit easier, there'd be even more competition, which would make it even harder. So my recommendation is if someone's listening to this and they're thinking it's frustrating, you should think, good, it's frustrating because most people won't figure it out. Yeah. That's why it's good. Yeah, we had a conversation with that actually about that yesterday uh, where a guy from uh, from Client Culture, from our member group, uh, all his emails got banned, banned uh, because of, uh, of one.com. I think it's one.com that just banned all the emails in regards to cold email, I'm not sure. Uh, but all his emails got banned and i was like this is a good thing because there's less competition a lot of people will stop because it simply think that cold email won't work for the future it's just a very very good thing for us because there's less competition man and you'll get more replies yeah i i agree and again back to bare beginners if you're a bare beginner you have one two clients you should not be thinking about deliverability you should be personalizing emails and sending them by hand because you won't have these issues. But yeah, as as you scale up, deliverability becomes a pain. Now, one of our note on that, one thing that I do inside my company done for your meeting where we manage cold email campaigns is we also do deliverability consulting for larger companies, which is a really interesting service that most people haven't considered. But let's say that I work with a company that has, let's say 50 SDRs. Each of those SDRs, let's say, make $60,000 a year. So that is a lot of money we're pumping into SDRs. And let's say that they're not getting into the inbox, which most big companies aren't because they're using like one domain normally. If I can work with them on deliverability consulting, as long as I can improve their open rates, which is related to deliverability, by like 10, 20%, the amount of extra revenue generated and the amount yeah. made per employee we're paying for is insane. So if anybody's listening to this and like, I love deliverability, I love the tech of cold email, there is so much money to be made in deliverability consulting. And there is no competition because there is no good resources and you have to figure out things yourself, which most people can't do. Um, that makes it an amazing offer. Yeah, that's great. And also just newsletters. A lot of people are hosting newsletters and also just the fact that you can actually do deliverability consulting there. There's so many opportunities when it comes to that. Yeah. I mean, even email marketing, what you do, I mean, uh, yeah. you know, if you're, if you can improve someone's deliverability by 10%, you improve their revenue by 10%, you need to change the copy or anything. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's an amazing offer. And, um, I like that it's technical because it also has a, a higher barrier to entry and fewer people you're going to compete with. Yeah. Makes sense. Agreed. Awesome. So how do you, you say that you're sending out a huge, huge volume, but also how do you personalize the emails? What is the, do you find a kind of balance or do you get just hyper-personalized every single email that you're sending out? So when people are just starting, I recommend doing hyper-personalization and I still do some completely personalized emails that I have an SDR who does for me. But for the most part, I, at, at my scale, we do what's called segmented outreach. What that is, is we're putting together a really specific persona 
where if I write a message to that one persona, we're going to have a lot in common with everybody else in that grouping. Um, I'll, I'll give I'll give uh, I'll give an example. I have a, a client right now who sells a specific metal de medical device to physical therapists. And this email only goes to physical therapists. And it's not really case studies, but all the use cases are for physical therapists. All the language in the copy is for physical therapists. And the introducing line is very specific to physical therapists. So it's not like it's feeling like they sent it just to that physical therapist, but it's so specific that it resonates well. And that's yeah. what I call like segmented personalization. So that could be like an e-commerce, let's say. Let's say that you have a case study. I'm just making this up with a... Um, a, a kitchen knife brand. They sell kitchen knives. If you do another campaign to kitchen products with that case study, it's highly relevant. And maybe in your introduction, you can have something that broadly works with every kitchen brand. Um, this is not a great example right here, but you're like, hey, first name, um, as someone who's, uh, since my girlfriend's always dragging me into the kitchen to cook with her, uh, I could really see how a company name could be helpful. Yeah. kind of works for every kitchen company and you have a relevant case study and you have a relevant examples and kind of bypasses the need to personalize every single one. But you should only do that, I think, after you have case studies and social proof and know who you're targeting. If you're still at zero, again, complete personalization because uh, you have the time and you need to sell on the emotional. This is definitely more of a logical sell. Yeah, so sell on the emotion whenever you begin and whenever you're getting into the more uh, branding, then you can uh, can start focusing on the more logic sell. Yeah. Awesome, man. Fantastic. So you personalize your messages. That's also what we do. We like we specify the campaigns towards a specific segment. And also we do something if we can scrape uh, data points, like data points, for example, whenever they uh, founded their company. So we say amazing that you've been around since uh, founded year, whatever. You know, uh, If we can find a lot of data points about them, uh, it's just about using them and being creative in the campaign. So it makes sense. Yeah, I definitely agree. And you can even like, this is a... This is somewhere between personalization and segmented, but you can even hire a virtual assistant to go pull like one specific word off a website. Maybe you have a personalized line based around a product name. And it's just a VA of it's grabbing a product name and copying and pasting into your lead list. Yeah, agreed. So what platforms do you host your emails on? Is that uh, like Google Workspace or Outlook? You said that you diversified them, but what is your typical yeah. go-to platform? For most, for most people, for emails, Outlook, Outlook, it's Outlook or Google, um, if you're targeting large companies, do 75% Outlook, 25% Google. If you're targeting smaller companies, uh, do 75% Google, 25% Outlook. Because larger companies use Outlook and getting Outlook into Outlook's inbox is easier. All right. So larger companies actually use Outlook more than Google Workspace. Yeah, especially like traditional corporates. Huh. Okay. And there's a higher chance that they're going into the main inbox then or what? Yeah. Not, not by, it's not like a make or break. It's just slightly better. Yeah. All right. Makes sense. And you said that you had a lot of uh, employees now. How big a percentage are uh, doing lead generation of those employees that you have? Yeah. M majority. Like uh, of, of, of the 16 we have, it's like eight. Yeah. Eight people who are doing lead generation full time. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And so they're building like lead lists from the, from, from the bottom and up, right? Yeah. So we, we have some ways of automating lead gen, but also we want to, sometimes we want to build a list that's like not possible to scrape. So we need to do yeah. a mixture of manual and automation. Like, um, for example, if I was just building a list of like, just making this up, um, landscapers in Florida, that's something that can be done automatic. We actually have our own in-house software that like builds this like that immediately. <laughs> um, but if I wanted to scrape YouTubers who posted a video about drop shipping in the last four weeks, like there isn't really a way to automate that. There needs to be someone to manually go and look for them. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So what, what software do you typically use whenever you're just scraping them? So we actually have our own software we built. It's called Contact Quack, um, which is kind of a funny name, but contactquack.io. Um, we Right now we have it in like beta. We just have been releasing it to like friends. But if you go to Contact Quack, actually, sorry, it's .com. I thought we bought .io. We did it. <laughs> Contactquack.com slash scrape. It's, uh, it's a tool that we use internally and we've released it to like we haven't like actually started marketing it. We just release it to like friends and a few people. And um, basically what it does is what's called waterfall enrichment. So if you just use one tool to get leads, like for example, just Apollo, you only yeah. get a small percentage of a total amount of leads available because different tools have different databases. And this tool goes through a bunch of databases and just keeps trying to get the contact. So like the percentage of contacts you get are way higher. Yeah, totally agree. And I also say to, to the most members inside of client culture that, hey, start on Apollo. And then whenever there's no more leads there, 
go out on external platforms and try to scrape your leads there because a lot of people have very, very easy access to um, to Apollo, which means that the reply yeah. rates are probably going to go down uh, compared to you going out to external uh, third-party uh, platforms to scrape a lot of leads. And the harder, again, the harder it is to scrape the leads, the less people are contacting them uh, equals higher response to you. Yeah. One awesome. consideration as well as Apollo is a database, meaning it has existing data that you pull from. Whereas there's other tools that pull new data. So you plug in a website and then they find the email real time. So yeah. that gets you fresher data. Makes sense. And what about follow-ups? How many follow-ups do you typically send? I know that's probably different from brand to brand, but I'm hearing some friends who are sending fucking, uh, sending follow-ups for two months in a, in a row and some people who are sending like four uh, follow-ups. So what is the, the go-to there? If somebody has not responded, sending follow-ups for multiple months, in my opinion, is not smart for deliverability reasons because Google sees that you just keep sending somebody an email or Outlook and they're not yep. responding and that's not good. Um, also, we we do a lot of data analysis between our clients. We found that email one has the highest conversion into a lead. So if we're considering that we can send so many emails per email address per day, we want to optimize for sending as many email ones as possible. So to answer that question, we normally do... Um, a three email sequence, one, two, three. But on email one, we'll have like five versions, like four to five versions, because it's the most important. So we have email one, many versions, email two, and email three. Now, if someone doesn't respond to any of those, we just throw them in a different sequence. Not not the same like sequence was long, just a new sequence like two, three months later. Now, if somebody responds as they're interested, they become a prospect, that is when you shouldn't stop following up. So when someone's expressed interest, that is then when you want to add them to your CRM and fault with them for years. Not harass yeah. them. There's a, there's, a, there's a fine line between harassing and following up, but following up for years. So you're following up every day, uh, following up every week on them, every uh, month? No, yeah. It's uh, my frequency drops. Um, I I have it in a in an SOP for our appointment setters. Let me, if I can actually, I can actually tell you the sequence we do. One second. Um, let me actually grab the exact one. Here we go. So when I, when someone has answered me and then they've ghosted me, I follow up three days, then five days after that, 10 days after that, 20 days after that, 50 days after that, then a hundred days after that. And once I'm at a hundred days, I stay every hundred days. Hmm. Wow. So you follow up multiple, like, yeah. And also just because there's so much worth for you. Yeah. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. People already said very interested. You know, I've, I've been around long enough, but I've had some deals close after like two years. Um, wow. so it does happen crazy. crazy awesome so have you found um, certain industries or business model when cold email is more effective we all just spoke about uh, e-commerce which is like kind of tricky but still can succeed with it uh, we're succeeding with it but we have to send out a lot of emails to get uh, get some book meetings but have you found certain industry, industries where like cold email just crushes completely yeah definitely definitely so um, the industries that cold email does best. So one, one note, there's always going to be people who are just like, do well in any industry. Like the best always is the best. Like, for example, I've worked with like some people in e-com where like their case studies are going to be like Nike, Rolex, Clorox, like, you know, it's just the biggest companies you could possibly imagine. And they're huge and they are the best. Like they are going to dominate everybody else, even in a competitive industry. Most yeah. people will never get there. Like never get to that pure level of dominance. Now, in terms of Outside of those, just I'll give one more example. I had a guy selling um, Instagram growth, like Instagram who grows Instagram pages, and he had 3 million followers. Do you think anybody else could compete with him on Instagram growth? No, yeah. like you are nothing compared to him. It doesn't matter how, like, it, it doesn't matter. So the the dominant people who are uh, try to who I try to work with, they're always going to crush. Um, yeah. But most people will never be in that position. I'm not in that position. I probably will never be in that position. Um, so in terms of less competitive industries, there's definitely, there's definitely some that are clearly less competitive. The main thing is going to be barrier to entry. So the harder a industry is to get in, I think the better. And that can be in two ways. So most people have what I call copy paste business models. It stems from a YouTube video or like a course or like some type of like existing business template, which means there's a bunch of people doing it. And that makes it more competitive where I have some clients where like their offer was like completely made up by their own creativity or experimenting and no one else does it. Those people do really well. And then the second is barrier to entry where something is just really hard to get into. For example, I love doing cold email for medical products, but some of these medical products take like 
10 years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to get them approved. So naturally there's going to be less competitors because True. it's so damn hard to get into that market. Yeah, totally agree. So barrier to, barrier to entry, that's a, that's a big one. And also just a, yeah. if they have a good brand already. Yeah, and uh, avoiding like course stuff. Like yeah. if there's a course showing you exactly how to do something, it, it's a lot more competitive. Like um, I'll, I'll give an example. M most people just like robots when it comes to just like copying things they see online and not thinking. Um, so the people who know how to think creativity, creatively and critically are going to do a lot better. Um, I'll give an example. Like how many people have like a UGC agency, like a million, like I get like 20 of these emails a day and they're all the same. None of them are any good and they're all doing the same things and none of them know how to think. That sounds yeah. mean, but it's true. Um, I've had one person email me where he's like, he does UGC, but instead of just repurposing a YouTube video to short form, which is what every other person has been pitching me multiple times a week for the last two years, he'll take your YouTube videos and turn them into SEO optimized blog posts yeah. and short form and tweets. Out of the 1,000 short form emails I've gotten, there's been one person who was smart enough to think maybe I should slightly diversify myself and my offer. Those are also the people who do well, people who are able to not just follow because most people just follow things step by step and don't think. Yeah. um and that's kind of a mean way to say it but it's ultimately true yeah it makes sense it makes a lot of sense and also just just the fact there's so many tools and so many ways that you can help businesses and if you actually stand out for example google google essence and seo search engine optimization you said it yourself you are getting getting a good a good amount of leads inbound leads from uh, from seo uh, as well so helping businesses local businesses with seo can can help a lot uh, i heard about i can't remember what the name is just nilson i believe he built a Three hundred thousand dollars per month plumbing agency, and where they're just doing SEO, search engine optimization, optimization for them, and they are making them rank number one in that local town. So just being creative in regards to what they are offering instead of just doing Facebook ads, um, that's that's huge, man. Yeah, I, I think that's everything. You know, there's always going to be like, whenever somebody, whenever something becomes popular, the the first people who implement it, it works. There's not that many, and just like as time goes on, like there, there's some things that are just like, they're just like a I don't know, like just, just not dead, but whenever I like have people pay for consulting or like I, I see her in these certain industries of service pairings, I'm like, if you're really passionate about this and you really want this to be the thing you do, you can do it. However, life will be significantly easier if you don't do this thing. Yeah, true. Awesome. Well, we are going back to something that I uh, I think is very, very interesting. It's hiring management of people, management of emotions. How do you hire people um, in in your in your business? How, what is your yes. hiring process in regards to how do you find like real talent that actually wants to stay with you? Yeah. So a couple answers to this. Um, one thing is I think at some point you need to hire relatively Western talent. Um, I have seen very few agencies grow to millions of dollars just with VAs. And there's nothing against VAs. Like I, I love my virtual assistant employees and my Filipino team and Thai and Indian and Bengali. But at some point you need like Western talent. So um, that's one thing I would mention. Another thing too is um, when I hire Western talent, I like to hire Westerners who live in Asia. Uh, I'll give an example. We had a director of fulfillment who could have made 60, 70 K um, back in the UK, he's, he's British, um, but he was living in Thailand. And in Thailand, 3K a month was a great salary because cost of living is like $1,000 and he wanted flexibility. So I love to hire like Americans or Brits or Australians or Canadians in Asia because you get Western talent for somewhere between VA pricing and like American salary pricing. Um, another thing we do with hiring is we do a lot of interviews like i think a lot of people will post a job and talk and have like 20 applicants yeah. we try to get like 300 to 500 applicants on roles like a really high volume and we run them through like a um interview funnel where they fill out information record a video and apply and then yeah. we do a five minute video a five minute interview that's based on eye contact personality camera internet speed then we do a 30 minute interview and then we do a paid test task which is where we pay people to do a task related to the role. It is paid because it takes like four or five hours. And then from there, we normally do a trial period and hire. Now, one more thing I'll note on this is um, I really like working with people in person, which is ironic because I, I travel around. I have been to a lot of countries to visit team members. And I've flown a lot of team members to visit me. Like right now, for example, I have, um, I have three of my team members here in Thailand. I flew one from Zambia, 
and I flew two from India and they're living um, across the street from me for one month and we're doing in-person training. So when I want to bring people into like more leadership roles, I will fly them to me or I will fly to them to, I think it's, I think it's really like really helps when you can say like you've met someone's family or they've spent time with you on a personal level, like I actually know you. So I also am really big on like in-person development with your team. Even like back when I was like nine, you know, 18 years old, I flew to India for the first time, meet some of my team members in India. And then when I was 19, like back when I was first starting, I spent a month in Bangladesh working with my team in Bangladesh. And um, I think most people are just too lazy to do that or don't see the value in it, but it really can help doing that in-person bonding. Wow, that's amazing. That's a little bit more complicated than actually we do. And that's a lot of effort you're putting into every single employee. That's amazing, man. Yeah, it it, it pays off well. You get people that are like extremely, extremely loyal. Um, yeah. One other recommendation I make on hiring is that there's a lot of amazing employees in countries that you can't reach them. And I'll give an example of this. I have a I have a Zambian employee who's here in Thailand right now. It's his first time leaving the country, so it's super exciting for him. Um, but he is somebody that would be almost impossible to find because if you're Zambian, your government, I, I won't get into politics, pay, paying this dude is a pain to ask because there isn't Stripe, there isn't PayPal, there isn't TransferWise, there is no payment infrastructure in Zambia and most of Africa as well um, and a lot of countries in Asia too. Um, so this guy, for example, if you applied on, if you posted a job on Upwork, he won't be able to access it. On LinkedIn, can't hmm. access it. On Indeed, can't access it. So a lot of people we hire, we hire people from weird random places where we're tapping into a talent pool that other people can't reach because they don't fit into the parameters of a normal hiring platform. Hmm. Wow. So that's an interesting one. Like, for example, we hired him on Reddit because anybody can go on Reddit and apply for a job. But if I post on Upwork, there is no Zambian with an Upwork account that I know of because the, the payment infrastructure doesn't work with Upwork. Like you can't. Um, no. So we also like to hire people from countries that lack the payment structure to be able to go on platforms so we can tap into some talent, which otherwise you couldn't, couldn't find. Or even like I've been to Bangladesh quite a few times now, I think for whenever I go to Bangladesh, I'll go to the local universities and meet the business professors at local universities. And I can recruit people directly out of university at Bangladesh where, you know, they're going into a full-time corporate career where they're expecting to work, you know, over full-time for a salary that is pathetic and I can pay them double that and it's still a great deal for me. And I have like fresh talent that speaks good English and they're really smart, but they would never have a chance to get approved on Upwork, for example. No, makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And also just the fact that maybe you should try to to focus on attracting talent instead of just trying to always pull uh because that's, for example, whatever we do is that we put in a loom in the hiring funnel that we have. Uh, so we put in a loom in regards to hey, saying, like, we try to show them personality so they actually know what they can expect and trying to focus on the benefits they can get working with us. But I'm still having some issues with, like, hiring third world country people. Like, we're still having, uh, like, 50% of all the people that we we hire, we fire again in the in the first two weeks, one week. Yeah, Um it depends. I mean, part of it might be training too. Like we hire for some roles, which are roles that are made to follow very specific processes, which require a lot of training and love. Um, and then we hire for some roles which are beyond that. So um, that test task I mentioned is a really good good thing to do because it gets you a little bit of a sample of work before you fully hire somebody. And um, you know, if you're hiring like a someone to do lead gen. You give them a lead gen task where maybe it takes them four or five hours. You compensate them for it because you're asking them to do something kind of big and yeah. that can save you a lot of time. Yeah, agreed. Makes sense. So actually just pay, pay them for the job and see if they know what they're talking about and then potentially hire them full time. Yeah. And one other consideration too is like if you're hiring in a lot of countries in Asia in particular, they have really strong family units. Like let's say that you're hiring in the Philippines. It's very likely that your team member in the Philippines lives either with or next to her cousins and aunts and uncles and brothers and whatever. So sometimes we'll like hire just in a family because yeah. if we hire like a rock star Filipino VA. If you ask like, Hey, do you have any like family that need a job? Yes. The answer is always yes. And then that person can train them. And there's also the social pressure of this family is being financially supported by my company where it adds in a little bit of like, if somebody slacks to every family members will get on them. So hmm. myself and many other people I know will hire within the same family. 
yeah we also did the same thing with my uh, like coo right now lee uh, we just asked her and he has she had like three people that we hired immediately after we saw how smart they were yeah that's sweet yeah crazy what is the future of cold email in the next five years where is cold email then um deliverability is becoming harder um, which is yep. going to make it less competitive and better for people that can get around it. Um, AI is making offer and social proof more important because writing a good cold email isn't that hard anymore. It's still not easy. You still take skill, but like AI is making personalization and writing cold email less difficult, which makes your offer and social proof um, more important. So like two big themes, I would say social proof just helps with everything with ads, with trade shows, with cold email, with mail, with cold calls, with you know, social proof is always going to be good and deliverability is getting harder. So, you know, um, that is something that I personally like because it's going to weed out competition. Yeah, agreed. And what about AI? Are you using AI right now to personalize? No, um, we, we, we play around with it. Um, it's not consistent enough yet that it's helpful for a lot of things from what I found because it's good like half the time, but because it's good half the time, that means you need to pay somebody to then go and correct the other half and to look yeah. and see what is good or what's not good. Another consideration is my clients aren't like young guys that are like forgiving for a slight mistake. If I send a cold email from a brand that you probably recognize and they're, you know, they're on TV, whatever, they're a big, they're a big company. And let's say the personalization actually said, accidentally said something racist or aggressive or just really off-putting. That looks really bad for a big company if that turns into something that's publicized. I mean, think about like if any big company had a personalization, it was accidentally very offensive and then it was sent to the wrong person who posted it on Twitter. So there's a lot of liability in using AI right now for big yeah. companies. Agreed. It's the same thing that we see also just the fact that we don't feel like sometimes you, you can maybe like make AI very, very effective when it comes to personalization, but it's like, it's so easy to spot. Like whenever somebody is trying to use, uh, like we have sometimes have someone who are trying to just send a cold email straight from chat TBC. It's like, you, you can't do that. It's you, you can't do that. Uh, in, in my opinion, it's so hard to actually, like, it's so easy to see, especially from your, for, from your, your ICP who probably also knows chat TBC. Like it's so easy to spot. I have definitely gotten my share of like really bad AI personalization. I uh, yeah. I have a I have a file where I keep my favorite bad cold <laughs> emails. Awesome. All right. All right. You live in Thailand, right? Yeah, Thailand. How is life there? Why did you choose Thailand of all countries? Yeah. So um, I uh, I've been traveling a lot since uh, for some context. I'm 23. I've been traveling since I turned 18. Um, went on my first trip to India, which was related to work as well. And um, since then, I've been to about 40 countries. So I've, I've been been a lot of places. And uh, I like I like Asia, my favorite continent. So uh, Thailand, it's friendly in terms of long term visas. The people are nice. The safety is great. I have a lot of friends here. There's a lot of entrepreneurs here. Um, I, I just really like it. I you know I, I I also can own real estate. So like I have my own place that I own here, which is nice to come back to like an office that's dedicated for work. And then I just, from here, I travel around like this year, for example, I went to Qatar, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, um, Malaysia, Cambodia. So I use it as like a base and then I just kind of go around other places and come back. Awesome. Well, that's pretty much it. I think that's, this is so valuable for, for most people, also for me, uh, most definitely hearing from, uh, from a veteran like you. So thank you so much for your time, uh, Michael. I appreciate it a lot. I think that the people see this also appreciate this a lot because there's a lot of insights. You're going to find this on YouTube. You're going to find this like insights like this other places in my opinion. So uh, thank you so much for your time, man. Very much appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun. Yeah. All right. Take care. Have an amazing day, man. You too. Bye.